Okay, we're going to get started with the pre-lab calculations for experiment 7, equilibrium. I've changed all of the numbers on the pre-lab assignment, so I won't be doing the exact same thing that you're doing, but I'm going to walk you through how you would carry out these calculations. To begin, we're asked to find the initial concentrations of Fe3 plus and SCN minus, or iron 3 and thiocyanate ions in the solution. In order to find the concentration, all we need to do is figure out the moles divided by the volume. The tricky part here is, of course, that we're mixing three things together. We have the iron 3 nitrate, the potassium thiocyanate, and also water. So our total volume is going to be different than the volume that we have of each of these individual things. So I'll start with calculating the concentration of Fe3+. This will just equal the number of moles. In order to find the moles, I multiply the molarity times the volume. I used, in this case, 6 milliliters, 0.006 liters, and that's also our concentration, 0.006 moles Fe3 plus per one liter of solution. That gives me the moles of iron, and now to find the concentration, I divide by the total volume. In this case, it's 10 milliliters. I end up with 0.0036 molar Fe3 plus. You would do the same thing for thiocyanate. If you did that, you should get 0 0.00023 molar thiocyanate. And um, you could also, of course, express these in scientific notation. I'm going to just leave them as they are. The next question asks us to use Beer's law. So we need to remember what Beer's law is. The absorbance equals epsilon CL. Epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient, um, which is given to us in this case. C is the concentration in molarity, and L is the path length in centimeters, which is just the distance that the light is traveling through the solution. Um, pretty much every spectroscopy experiment that you're going to do, you'll always have a path length of one, so a lot of people ignore that. But nonetheless, that's, uh, that is Beer's Law. So all we have to do is plug in the numbers that we have here. Again, I've changed them. But if our absorbance is 0.43, that will equal epsilon, which they've given 3,000 liters per mole centimeter. The concentration, which we're trying to find, that'll be in molarity moles per liter. And the path length, which is 1 centimeter. I just solve this for the concentration, and I get 0.00014 moles per liter. So this will be our equilibrium concentration of our complex ion. Okay, um, this will make a little more sense when we do the next question. So we have Fe3 plus. It reacts with SCN minus, and we have an equilibrium forming with our complex ion. So what's happening? We started with an initial amount of this, an initial amount of this. We mix them together. We're going to get some of this. So I'm going to make an ice table. This is an easy way to organize your initial concentrations, the change that happens, and the equilibrium. So our initial concentrations that we had, we calculated in the first step. Then a change happens. We're going to lose some of these. We're going to gain some of this. Of course, we didn't have any at the beginning. And at equilibrium, we're going to have 0.0036 minus x. 0.0023 minus x, and x over here. That's convenient because we actually know this number. We just calculated it. That's our molarity of our complex ion at equilibrium. We got that from the absorbance because, remember, this has that distinctive red color. Okay, so all we have to do is figure out now what the difference is between these things. We subtract the initial concentration minus the equilibrium concentration of the complex ion. 
So in this case, 0 0.00023 minus 0 0.00014 will give us our final concentration here. 0 0.0036 minus 0 0.0014, we get 0 0.0035. Okay. Um, now we're asked to find the equilibrium constant. We know all of the concentrations at equilibrium. So we're going to make an equilibrium expression, which is just going to be the products over the reactants. We'll just plug in their concentrations. and we'll end up calculating an equilibrium constant value. The equilibrium constant doesn't have any units. It's a little bit complicated why, um, but it doesn't. Okay, so um, now we're gonna start looking at the temperature dependence. It turns out the Van T Hoff equation will give us information about the temperature dependence. The Van T Hoff equation is the log of the equilibrium constant equals negative delta H over R times one over T plus delta S over R. Now this is conveniently organized in a sort of Y equals MX plus B plot. If this is our X, because we're plotting that on the X axis, and this is our Y, because we plot it on the Y axis, then the slope of this line is gonna give us delta H over R, and the Y intercept gives us delta S over R. So to find delta H, all I'm going to do is take my slope value, and that equals negative delta H over R. Um, R in this case, we're going to want to use 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin because we're dealing with energy here, not gases. I'll substitute that in, and I'm going to calculate delta H as negative 29,000 99 joules per mole. I'm going to keep this number around because I want to uh, use it when I'm calculating delta G, but really we only have two sig figs here, so we could also say negative 29,000 joules per mole or negative 29 kilojoules. For delta S, I take my y intercept, in this case negative 3.22, that's going to equal delta S over R. Again, I use the same value of R, 8.314, and my delta S equals negative 26.8 joules per mole Kelvin. Uh, again, you could also write here negative 27 joules per mole Kelvin. To find the delta G, we say delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. I'm going to do this at 298 Kelvin room temperature. And again, I'm just going to plug in these values that we calculated above. So I'll have negative 29,099 joules per mole. That's my delta H minus the temperature, 298 Kelvin, times negative 26.8 joules per mole Kelvin, and I'm going to end up with my delta G equal to negative 21,113 joules per mole. To report this, we would probably say negative 21 kilojoules per mole. And that's our final answer. So those are the calculations for this lab. You have another question at the bottom that's asking you to sort of think about uh, Le Chatelier's principle. So I'm just gonna give you some hints about things you would wanna write here. When it asks for the direction of the shift, there's sort of three ways that you can do it. You could draw a right arrow. If it was going to the right, you could say to the right, or you could say towards the products. Those are all equivalent things. You could also say, uh, it's going to the left or toward the reactants. Over here, what we're really asking is what is it going to look like? It asks for an observation. 
So we want to know if there's a color change. So for example, in this case, would it become more red? Would it become more yellow? Those are basically the options that you have. Good luck. I'll see you this week.